what's going on guys it is brian and jack with superman's comics and we have another great episode of that creator spotlight for you as you know we like to dig into any comics in here and any comic creators and we have a special guest with us tonight almost needs no introduction we've talked about a bunch of his books on this channel before but we have frank gogol from dead end kids grief and a new comic coming up we're going to talk about that in just a minute but frank we want to welcome you to the channel and Tell us a little bit about yourself, let our viewers know who you are, just in case they aren't aware, and where you come from, and all about your work. All right, yeah, what's going on, guys? Uh, thanks for having me, obviously. Um, I'm a big fan of the show. It's one of the few YouTube shows I can sit through, so thank you for that. Um, and uh, for your viewers, I'm Frank Gogol. As you said, I wrote Grief, which was nominated for a Ringo Award last year, Dead End Kids, which was crazy crazy overwhelming success and i am the writer of a new book no heroin that we're going to talk about a little bit tonight um i write comics for source point press i've been writing comics for it'll be four years next month so i haven't been doing this too long um but i am a lifelong comic fan and uh yeah that's that's who i am and this this episode of simple man comics is brought to you by jameson for st patrick's day yes we, yes we've had jameson as a guest on this channel a few a few times a few times <laughs> So you mentioned uh, Dead End Kins, and I think that's where we're going to kind of kick things off because, you know, we're, we're definitely here to talk about your new project, but we'd be really remiss to not bring up the success of Dead End Kids. And, you know, on the channel, whether it was the Bolo show, um, uh, you know, the Hot and Cold show, uh, various programming that we've had, uh, big Bolo list uh, book, um, Definitely one we talked about with the Indie Spotlight series with Andy Tomberlin, who really put Brian and I on the book very early. Um, but, you know, I know our viewers are probably familiar from it for that big secondary market success um, was a big hit with readers, tough to find. Um, and, you know, first thing I'd like to ask is how have, has things changed for you in the time since that book has come out and saw the success that it has? Uh, wildly, like I can't even, I honestly haven't thought too much about it cause I haven't stopped like writing and, and promoting stuff and like, I haven't really taken any time to think about it, but like, just like some really like small things in my life have changed. Like at conventions, people, people come up to me now like that, that never happened before. Like may, maybe once or twice prior to that, cause from my first book grief, which was like a really successful Kickstarter. Um, but people, people are coming up to me and asking me and like know things about me that like I didn't realize were like public information, like what my dog's name is and like, uh, which like, you know, it's fine. Like people are enthusiastic. I don't, I'm not scared or anything. Um, but uh, that, that's, that was pretty cool. Um, I've been talking with Marvel a little bit, like not, nothing crazy, but uh, Dead End Kids definitely opened the door for me to be able to have conversations with people over there. Uh, and, uh, and I've submitted samples and stuff like that. So that's been pretty cool. Um, <clears throat> there's no ink on any contracts or anything yet, but uh, we've had myself and source point press have had conversations with people in LA and New York about adapting the book into a movie or a television series, stuff like that. Um, again, like that's not happening. I'm not like letting it slip or anything. Um, I actually caught somebody on eBay trying to say that it had gotten optioned and I bought that book. Uh, it was a nine, eight copy of number one. And I bought it. So that guy, I spent 40 bucks and I wanted that guy to see my name on the, the label before he shipped it out to me and feel real dumb. Um, I hope he did. That's uh, funny. Yeah. And it's crazy that I got it for, for 40 bucks. Like some, yeah. some like the non-slab versions go for about that much or they were for a long time. They're probably cheaper now. I, I don't look all the time. Um, but yeah, I mean, things, things have just changed in general. Like my, like, yeah, the, 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 caliber of other creators who like know my name and are like willing to give me the time of day like it was it's a big turning point like yeah open some doors it seems yeah yeah like i mean i i you know not to mince words or like you know, toot my own horn or blow smoke in my own ass or whatever the phrase you want to use but like it's it, it was it was definitely a game changer yeah around uh baltimore comic-con you and i had a conversation on <laughs> sunday at baltimore comic-con and um, Brian and I had talked to several publishers that were present and um, um, some of the people that were um, there in Baltimore, uh, you know, for the awards and everything. Uh, and it was, it was real funny when we would get asked what creators we had our eye on and we would talk about you. It did very much seem like it wasn't something new we were telling people. Like people were starting to really pay attention. Um, 
So I, I can, I can definitely understand that. I think another side of it for us that we, we always talk about and see is the like retailer exclusive market. Um, you have a great reputation with retailers. You guys came out with some really unique collectible items um, surrounding dead end kids. Uh, what was kind of like your inspiration with that? Did you enjoy kind of that process? Uh, y yes and no. Um, like more yes than no, but like everything, you know, comes with like little, little caveats and whatnot. Um, I, I I'm honestly not like a big variant person. Um, like they, they just don't do a whole lot for me. I'm not against them. I have nothing against speculators or anything like that, but like in terms of my own collecting habits, like only a handful of variants have ever really jumped out at me. Um, <clears throat> uh, it, the one exception to that is uh, with the the Power Rangers books over at Boom. Some they just they have mastered the market of making them collectible and like you know making them into series that you need to get all of the covers. And I yeah. hate them. Tony Montez and Dan Mora recently. Yeah, I got all the Zord covers. I got all the helmet covers. It's stupid. Like I spent so much money. <laughs> I was looking at the Chris Anka trading card variants the other day, and I said, you know, I didn't really like them when they first came out, but now that I'm looking at like ten of them, man, they look kind of cool. Yeah, um, but but getting those um, covers together, it, you know, what's really cool is like when I started making comics, uh, I was paying for everything myself. Um, I paid. I I used to have like you see all these trades behind me. I used to have like a really nice omnibus collection like really, you know, expensive out of print books. And I sold a lot of them to make grief because comics are not cheap to make. And like, that was more important to me at the time. Um, but uh, those variant covers were the first thing in comics that anyone ever paid to have made for me. Um, so like uh, the retailers pay for the, the covers um, and then like the rights to use them in the print run and everything. That was, that was pretty cool. Um, and I'm, I'm a pretty hands-on kind of guy. Like I like to, to be involved with all the nooks and crannies and like learn everything I can about the comics market and, and like you know, what goes into stuff like that. So for, I'd say like nine in every 10 covers. And I think there were probably about 25 different covers. Um, I was involved with like the art direction and working one-on-one -on -one with the artists. Um, like I said, I'm not like a big variant guy, but I am very particular about book design and, and like sort of like what's representing me in the marketplace. And like, that's not a knock to any artist. Like everybody did a killer job but I just like to be involved. And I made a lot of really good friends doing it. Esteban Salinas, who did all the Black Cape comics covers. He and I are super close now. Um, Colm Griffin, who did the, uh, the hip hop comics, the, the Canadian exclusive, he and I talk all the time. I mean, like, it was just, it was just my way of networking and, and getting stuff out there. Um, but like, I don't know if anyone noticed, but like, if you go through all the variants, the back cover changes every single time to match the front cover. And so does the inside credits. Um, with the exception of one that we couldn't get it in on time. But like, that's the kind of stuff, like I really, I'm big on comic book packaging. Like Jonathan Hickman is a huge influence for me. So like, you know, the cover, the, the, the design of the inside, the back cover, like how it all comes together makes it feel like one product. And I think on some level that was part of what made Dead End Kids a success. Like people, people don't necessarily realize it when they're holding something that feels like a whole package, but they get it like sort of instinctually and it makes them think it's more valuable. I mean, that's just how I feel when I pick up like a Hickman or a Remender book. Um, <clears throat> so like that experience was awesome. Um, like I said, people were paying for me to get art done rather than me unloading hundreds of dollars on a cover. Um, you know, it made me a lot of new friends. It was, it was great. Yeah, and we even talked in Baltimore about, you talk about the care for like the trade dress and the look of issues one through three and the real kind of symmetry that you get between those issues. Um, and I think all of that plays into the success, whether people realize it or not. Um, but of course, at the core of everything is a great, a great story. Um, and I think that's really what drove Dead End Kids. I think Brian and I have been talking about uh, it being a great, a great, opportunity for option at some point and i know there's going to be more to the dead end kids uh uh story um coming down the pike yeah yeah can't say anything too much about that because i'm still working on it uh but number two yeah if the world doesn't end we'll probably come by the end of the year yeah and i like i don't want to get too much into it let you kind of keep that as a bit of mystery but it's an it's gonna be an anthology right so number two would be a different group Yes, yes and no. Yes and okay. no. Um, I, I will, I guess I can say this, like it's not a spoiler or anything, but uh, number two will have a new set of kids. It'll be in a different place. It'll be in a different time, but it won't necessarily be disconnected from the first story. 
Um, and, and some of that depends on how well the second series does, like how, you know, and uh, yeah, that's, that's sort of getting into like the, the gears and bolts of everything, uh, of making comics. But, uh, if you like the first one and you want more, definitely pick up the second one and, and there could be a third one. You know, that's, that's the kind of way it works. Oh, I have full confidence that that'll happen. So yeah, Jack mentioned about being an option. I'm a huge eighties movies fan. So naturally I thought of like the movie Stand By Me while reading Dead End Kids. It kind of reminded me of Stand By Me and then Four Brothers, which I messed up earlier and was telling Jack to remind me of Step Brothers, but that's not the case. But previously, Jack was just talking about how we were, he was talking to you at Baltimore, talking about this, uh, the trade dresses, talking at Source Point Press booth at Baltimore. But there's another thing that goes on in Baltimore, and that's the Ringo Awards. And you were nominated for a Ringo Award in 2019 for your book, Grief, right? Yeah, yeah. Um... So for everyone watching, listening, who doesn't know, I, uh, my first book to ever come out was uh, an anthology called Grief. It's um, 10 short stories about the grieving process told with like monsters and aliens and like sort of wrapping up really important topics and like dope stories that, you know, are more comic-y than, than the, the, the subject matter. Um, and it was, at first it was a digital only Kickstarter, um, did really well on Kickstarter uh, Source Point Press picked it up and it sold really well there. We sold out the print run in less than a year, uh, which is crazy for an anthology and a book that deals with topics people don't want to really engage with. Um, and this is, you know, like in terms of the first book, I couldn't really ask for like a better book. Like, you know, it did so much for me to open the door at Source Point Press. It got me my first fans. Uh, it made me my first dollars as a comic creator. Um, and just when I thought like it couldn't do anything more for me, it, it got this Ringo nom for best anthology. Um, and it, you know, that was, that was incredibly flattering and, and, and just, you know, I super appreciate like, um, cause the process for the Ringos is pretty complicated. It's like, there's a fan vote portion and then there's like a, like an Oscars board panel vote type thing. And, and then there's like a final vote to decide who wins. And, you know, like, I don't know, like we didn't win um, Where We Live, the Vegas shooting anthology from uh, Image One, and that's a fantastic book, so I have absolutely no hard feelings. But like, you know, here's like no nomination, here's a nomination, and here's like a win. Like, it's, it's, it's a very, very small margin. And I'm, like I said, I'm incredibly proud. All of my collaborators, uh, of whom there are 10, so I'm not going to be able to name them all, but um, I'm excited for them. I'm excited for myself. And I like, you know, just to have been writing comics for, at that point, a little over three years, and that be my first book and get, you know, picked up for a major industry award. Like, that was super gratifying. Yeah, I was going to say for people that aren't familiar with what the Ringos are, movies have like Oscars, Golden Globes, and SAG Awards. Comic books have like, the Eisner, the Harvey, and the Ringo, and Ringo's up there with like the top three awards. So be nominated for something like that, especially where you're coming from and your first book, that's phenomenal. Yeah, no, it was, it was absolutely, it blew my mind, honestly. Like I'm still, I, some mornings I wake up, I'm like, did that really happen? What are you gonna do? So Frank, you mentioned um, with grief that you were really happy with the numbers that it did, especially with the topics that it did that it dealt with um, grief and loss and you're not pulling any punches with your next series coming from source point Preds because the title is very apropos of the subject matter. Um, although we've got a cool little uh, vampire element in there, but we're talking about no heroin. Um, what can you tell us about this upcoming series? Uh, this, this is, this is my baby. Um, this is the thing I've been excited about for a long time. Uh, I started writing it before I wrote Dead End Kids, so that's, you know, this is sort of like, you know, that's sometimes how comics work, like, you know, things shift around on the publishing schedule and things get done faster than one another. So I've been sitting on this for a long time. Um, I'm a huge Buffy the Vampire Slayer fan, and this this is very much my Buffy love letter, but like told the way that I would tell it. Um, uh, and uh, super excited to be doing it uh, with Chris Mad, who did the covers for Dead End Kids. Uh, Chris is just an incredible collaborator. He and I used to share a comic shop in New Jersey before I moved to California. And we, we were friendly and we never like, you know, hung out or anything, but we talked you know, we were Wednesday warriors. So we were always there on Wednesday, picking up our books and we chatted. Um, and then we, we did a con together in Philly and we got to talking at the bar afterwards. And, and he was like, you know, if you ever want to do a book, you know, like let's, 
let's do something. Like, I think it'd be cool. And I was like, yeah, yeah, that would, that would be really cool. Um, but I didn't have anything at the time. Like I was getting ready to write dead end kids and, and, and do that whole thing. Um, so I said, yeah, I'll think about it. I'll see what comes, comes to mind. And then I got on the plane to leave the next morning. And by the time I got off the plane in San Francisco that night, I'd written like pretty much the whole first issue. Um, like between knowing my personal history and Chris's personal history and loving Buffy so much, like the story just kind of coalesced and poured out of me. Um, and it's, it's incredibly personal. Um, both Chris and I have histories of addiction in our family, in our own lives. Um, both of my parents were drug addicts when I was growing up. Chris is a 20 year recovering addict himself and doing comics is sort of how he got clean or part of it. Um, so there's just, there's just so much like raw emotion and energy in this book, but it's also like a really brutal book. Like dead end kids is like very quiet and, and, and sort of thoughtful and, and not very action based. Like I sat down to write this and I was like, what's the opposite of dead end kids, but like still the kind of story I want to tell. And like, I came up with basically punk rock Buffy. Uh, like the, the pitch we're going for uh, is essentially like, what if Buffy the Vampire Slayer crossed over with Tank Girl? Um, and you guys read the first issue. I read it. I think, I think we nailed it. Um, you guys, you guys want to see it? I have an actual copy. Yes. Yeah, see, really show, show, show the viewers the, the cover. All right. All right. So this, this is the cover to number one. Um, we were talking about packaging before. So this, this, this one's got the full package. Uh, the, the second cover for number two is going to be orange and, and reddish. The third cover is going to be green. The backs are going to match the same. Uh, and all the variants that we do for it are going to have sort of designed to match back. So like very much packaged all the way through, just like with Dead End Kids. Um, but th this this is a whole whole different ball game. Do you, again, uh, anticipate maybe a pushback or a reluctance within the market or community to sort of delve into these types of topics, even though they're topics that are affecting so many Americans right now and people all over the world? That, that's a pretty good question. And, and it's honestly not something that's crossed my mind. Um, it's, it's always a risk. Like it was with Dead End Kids too. Like Dead End Kids is, you know, it's like Stand By Me meets the Hardy Boys. Like it's, it's definitely like a kind of throwback 90s book. Uh, but it's also a book that deals with childhood trauma. And like, I've met a lot of like, middle-aged white guys not to call anybody out but like you know who who fit that common stereotypical uh comic book demographic who came up to me and talked about how much they loved the story and like what it got into um so i don't know like i'm i'm pleasantly surprised with like the different kinds of reaction i've gotten to dead end kids and like i don't know like my personal brand of storytelling is this kind of story like if nobody wants to read it like that's that's fine like I, i'm going to keep writing stories like this i hope people keep connecting with it people love grief people really dug dead end kids um this is very much a spiritual successor to those two in the same way um but like i said this this is probably the most comic booky thing i've ever written like it's got vampires it's got a lot of action um you know it's 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 probably the most source point press book I've ever written too. So like people who are fans of the publisher, people who are fans of Buffy, people who are fans of like monster books, horror books, um, you know, just stuff like that. Like this, this is probably my most broad reaching audience appeal type book I've done. So like, you know, I'd, I'd be surprised if people didn't connect with this one most, uh, but you never know. Like, and, and at the end of the day, I, I don't care about that as much as the people who it does connect with. Yes, absolutely. So I'll say one thing also. I've read Dead End Kids. I love Dead End Kids. You gave us this PDF version of this book to take a read ahead before we, t we talked on this video. And to be completely honest, I first started reading the issue and I, I was like, I was like, man, I love Dead End Kids, but this is starting off. I think this is going to be so cliche. But then I read it and the completely opposite, right? And the subject matter drugs and stuff like that it's kind of cliche but like you said your storytelling is completely different it grabs you it sucks you in and you're like within probably the first three panels you're already like okay now i'm starting to get into this and then you start going through it and it's like man this chick's badass and but she has her flaws yeah i don't want to get in too much and give the story away but i enjoyed the first issue and i was totally disregard the fact about being cliche by the time i completed that issue 
Yeah, I, you know, that's that's kind of the risk with with comics is you have to really get in and get people invested. Um, and like there's different sort of like storytelling strategies for that. Um, in Dead End Kids, I spent a lot of time in the beginning of the first issue, like with getting to know the kids, like making like I, it, I actually made a mistake, like in terms of like quality storytelling, um, having these splash page reveal on the second page of, of Ben floating dead in the lake. Like, you know, most people don't give a shit about a dead kid they've never heard of, like floating in the lake. Like it, it's, it's a cool page. It's a really powerful panel, but it doesn't really mean much when you first see it. Um, <clears throat> so after I wrote that, I had to spend the next probably eight pages of that first issue, like really earning like people feeling something about that. And then like hitting them again with that scene of the kids, you know, seeing all the cop cars down at the end of the street. Um, but like, that's just sort of how I, I tell stories. Like my, my primary concern is getting people to connect with the character and showing them something that they maybe haven't seen before or something they have. And, and, and they didn't, they don't see enough of in pop culture. Like I had a really crappy childhood. I grew up in a very poor part of New Jersey. Um, a lot of drugs where I grew up, a lot of, uh, you know, just crime in general and like, you know, sort of dead end kids like like people who i grew up with who i know are either dead or have a bunch of kids and live in a trailer now like and that's not a judgment like that's just an observation of where i grew up and like i wanted to tap into that and like i think that more people than we realize have that kind of you know childhood on some level or or at least have a childhood where they struggle with like trying to understand something that's happening around them and not be able to do anything about it um and and with with no heroin like you were <clears throat> saying a little while ago like drugs are a really bad problem in this country and i'm not talking like recreational drugs like smoke all your weed like go crazy um but like i i live in san francisco and i walk to work uh down market street which is sort of like the main thoroughfare here um and i pass like 20 or 30 people shooting heroin in the streets like every single day and this is like the nice part of town um and this is just one street in america like it's drugs are a real bad problem and it's affected me since like literally before i was born um and it's just something that i think you know given the the scope of the the opioid e epidemic you know that it's probably touched almost everyone and on some level everyone can relate to the subject matter um <clears throat> and that's balanced out by like a dope vampire story so yeah i i just i, I want to tell important stories, but I, I do want to be entertaining. Like, I don't always want to be bringing people down and like name all my books, like grief. You know what I mean? Well, I think that the, the vampire element, um, the R rated Buffy, you, you compare it to Buffy, but for those on the channel who maybe aren't Buffy fans, it's, it's a very um, much more mature version of Buffy that you would be, you're seeing in this book. Um, it does do a lot to maybe, um, make this book more accessible to somebody who uh the drug element because it's always interesting when you put drugs but I, at the same point i feel like drugs aren't talked about enough in the medium because it's a you know a taboo subject and you know there's still some who almost especially within the big two there's no comics code authority but you're still kind of living with that sort of mentality of you know you of one company being owned by Disney, one being com company being owned by Warner Brothers, you're only going to see so much. So this is the place for these stories. And um, you're absolutely right saying that. I think the biggest thing is that it, th this problem, it, it is an epidemic in the country. We're talking about a pandemic right now with, um, you know, what's going on with the coronavirus and, and um, all of our social distancing. Um, but at the same point, this is affecting so many families. And it's interesting to me because when you first talked about this book, uh, first time I ever talked to you about this book, I don't know whether it was online or at, at a convention, um, my feelings even on the importance of this book have changed because this has now impacted my family. Um, in full disclosure, a few weeks ago, I had a, a family member uh, who I had no idea was using heroin, overdose on heroin, rushed to the hospital, um, luckily was okay, um, and is in a rehab facility right now. But what this whole thing wasn't ever something I thought would affect me in that way. So uh, to sit down and read the book like I did today, it, it's like I'm looking at it through a completely different lens. So I, I think that there's going to be a lot of people out there who are going to connect to it in that way, which will probably far exceed those who make that initial judgment. I, I hope so. Um, it's, 
like uh no you're talking about you know this is kind of like your first uh touch point with something like this and and i think that a lot of people who don't have a touch point which i don't really think is very many people anymore Mm -hmm. but i think most people get their sort of impression from from pop culture right like movies tv um and and you know there's sort of like two ends of the spectrum that you really see there you see like this far one way direction where where like drug addicts are extremely villainized and they're all criminals and then you know they they don't do anything and it's just a total demonization of people and then on the opposite end of the spectrum you've got this sort of overly sympathetic like these are you know people who can't help themselves it's a disease you know and and, and you know they're for in my experience growing up knowing my parents and the people I grew up with um there's like this huge gray space in the middle and like these for the most part these are good people who are in a bad way um and you mentioned you know the the sort of overdose part of it um so like there's there's sort of three stages to drug addiction and and a lot of people don't really make it to the third one you get sort of the part where you're doing drugs you know it's sort of you don't have any structure imposed on you just kind of say fuck it and you do whatever you want and then you know you get arrested and you go to prison or you go to, to rehab and then you have like this extremely rigid structure imposed upon you and like you have no choice but to follow, you know, and, and stick with it. And then the, the sort of third act, and this is where so many people fail and cycle back into the addiction part is, is the recovery part. And that's like what this story is about. This is about somebody who wants to do better and is sort of living with this demon on their back. And, you know, every day is a struggle to try and do the right thing. Um, and it's, I mean, there's a ton of drama there. There's, there's a ton of, ton of like really raw stuff to, to dig into. The thing I love most about Kayla is that she's kind of a piece of shit. I mean, she, she really wants, she knows it, but she's trying to do better. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's all there is to it. Like, I mean, and, and she even learns in this issue, like she learns how, how even how little she knows about how terrible she is. Um, but, uh, you know, in spite of how bad she is, she wants to do the right thing, even if she doesn't go about it the right way. And like, I think that there's like a really interesting cross section between like the good and people and the bad people there. Uh, and like, this is kind of channeling a little bit of Murphy from Dead End Kids. Like, he's kind of a little piece of shit. Like, I mean, he's like torturing people and, and he's like making all these really terrible calls, but he also is like a 13 year old kid who doesn't really know what's going on and has suffered so much and is just making a bunch of bad choices. And you know, I think those are the kind of characters we care most about, like the ones who we can see a little bit of ourselves in and who are like kind of captivating and intriguing and like we want to see what they'll do next, even if it's terrible. You mentioned this book's coming out this summer. Do you know, do you have an actual release date for this yet? Yeah, I actually found out today. Uh, it's coming out June 24th, which this this is just occurring to me now and please don't cut this. Uh, but uh I sent you guys some uh, some sort of talking points to, as as like a starter, and and in there I talk about my my brother Joey, who's one of the four kids or three kids I grew up with. The four of us being myself and those three, and we were all the, the inspiration for the Dead End Kids kids. Um, one of the other four was my cousin Tom, uh, and that's his birthday. And he has been him and my brother Joey have both struggled tremendously with addiction for probably the better part of the last twenty years, and I've watched them like really struggle. And, and like, while I was writing this, my brother Joey OD'd and ended up passing away. I mean, like, it was really, really wild, but like, I'm just having this small epiphany that it's coming out on my, my cousin's birthday. Um, but yeah, uh, so it's coming out uh, June 24th. Uh, it will be, we haven't officially like announced the book officially, but I've been talking about it in podcasts since January. So it's definitely out there. Um, but the announcement will come at the end of the month, uh, around the 31st, the day or so before maybe, and then it'll be available for pre-order on the first. Now we talked earlier about the, uh, retailer exclusives, um, that, you know, really, helped to kind of get a lot of exposure to dead end kids. Will we be seeing um, some retailers stepping up and uh, working with you with no heroin? Uh, We've got a couple exclusives planned. Uh, I can't talk about everything yet, um, but uh, what what kind of- Esteban Salinas, Black Cape? Esteban and I had a long conversation at C2E2 and uh, yeah, I guess I could talk about it. We're gonna do a set of connecting covers for all three issues. yeah, I like I really like connecting covers. Uh Marvel did some really nice ones in like the early 2010s. Uh I think it was like Salvador LaRocca did like an Iron Man one with like all the villains and all the errors and there's a Spider-Man one. Um so we're going to do something like that. Uh 
each one will stand on its own so nobody has to buy all of them but like i like I like to reward people who, who see the series through. Like I know for speculators and investors and stuff like that, you know, issues two and three aren't going to necessarily be as important. But um, I also know that a lot of people who bought the book on spec ended up reading it and did go back to buy number two. Uh, the number two sales were just a shy, a, a hair shy of the first on initial order. So like, yeah. Number two is one of the hardest to get your hands on with dead end kids. Um, because there was like a slight drop off, not a huge one, but a slight one. And then people weren't doing as many of the exclusives with it. Um, so it, that book kind of dried up a bit and the reader buzz was so strong. Like you mentioned, somebody might've gotten into it for speculation, but people ended up liking the story and wanted to continue it. And I remember issue number two getting to like $20. It's not often <clears throat> that a second issue makes like the Bolo list, which is mm. really a secondary market driven list. Um, and I, I want to say all, all three issues ended up landing on the list. So uh, <laughs> that was a really a, a unique situation. So um, I think as soon as people are aware, Source Point Press, Frank Ogle, no heroin, I think they're going to get on board the same way. Yeah. I, and, you know, I think that uh, there was sort of a weird perfect storm uh, when it came to number two. We had uh, two delays on number one, one at the Diamond Warehouse and then for whatever reason, the second release date got pushed back like another week or another two weeks. And the book was due out in August or out in July and ended up coming out in August. It came out two weeks before number two. Um, so there, like the, the reorder window was like already closed on number two. Um, Cause that's it. You have, that those orders have to be in 21 days before release. So this came out 14 days before release. Um, <clears throat> so like that really limited it. Um, Actually, like number two was so hard to get that I ended up doing like a very small second uh, print run out of my own pocket just to make sure that I had copies to get to people so that way they could read it. Um, and those, those sold out like crazy, but they weren't were for they were for New York Comic Con, but we had them at New York Comic Con. I think I did 200 copies and like they were gone on the first day. Like, um, so like, yeah, no, I mean, I, I hope people will check this book out. And, and the, the second issue of this is real fucked up. Like it is dark it is violent i think it's probably the best thing i've ever written and the the ending is is just pitch perfect uh, i saw some chris's inks and pencils for number three today it's just this book just is gorgeous i mean like let me, let me show some of the pages here like this this is one of my favorite pages oh yeah, yeah, yeah. like i mean it's, i've never written a splash page uh I wrote this before I wrote Dead End Kids because I went on the plane the month before. That's the first splash page I ever wrote, and like it's, it kind of gives me chills looking at it still. Oh, it, it that is a, a st matter of fact a standout page when you're yeah. There's another one towards the end, but it's like it's like part of a setup and a payoff with like a, a joke and everything. So like I don't want to ruin that. Um, but uh, yeah, this I just love this book. It's gorgeous. Um, let me let me talk about the team a little bit. I talked about Chris already. Uh, we got Chris Mad from the covers of Dead End Kids on the interiors this time. We've got his daughter, Shauna Mad doing the colors, and she's never done a, a large comic book project like this before. She is absolutely killing it. Like, the colors in this are so vibrant and, like, so lush. Um, she, she's doing a really, really good job, and she's got a great sense of, like, color theory and, like, color story. I mean, she's – I'm surprised that she's not doing, like – better books than this um on letters we got sean reinhardt um who you whose name you probably don't know but he lettered um dead and kids and did a tremendous job like i mean like the letters in that book are fantastic and the the letters in this book are, are just as on point then on covers we've got ahmed rafit who i think this is going to be his first diamond book um but he's he's just like a hidden treasure he did some of the variants for dead end kids last year he did the uh the noir covers that we did uh as a convention exclusives um and he's he's absolutely killing it like i mean i got the the third cover in last night and it is like the number two dead end kids cover is my favorite cover of ever anybody's cover ever done ever made i just think it's gorgeous that this is a very close second like it is just as impactful and it is like it's kind of hard to look at um so but like i mean like this this team is superb um every one of these names with the exception of mine you should be hearing like on marvel books in a couple of years like I'll, I'll try to keep up with them but they're extremely talented well you mentioned marvel books and then one thing i was talking about how I, when i first started reading no heroin i was like man this is going to be cliche and i was totally blown away that it wasn't then you also mentioned during this interview how you're a huge buffy fan this is your punk rock buffy once you said that and i started thinking about the book again 
the, the story doesn't parallel it, but reading it and how excited I got from reading this first issue. Then when you said that, it reminded me how excited I got for another Buffy lover that wrote another vampire book for Image and Redneck number one. This one, no heroin number one, I like just as much the first time I read Redneck number one. So if you like Redneck and you're watching this video, definitely check out No Heroin. I'm not That's... saying it's the same exact story because there's a lot of differences, but I was that excited reading it. That, that's pretty high praise. I was a big fan of Redneck when I first started reading it. Like, I mean, it's, um, that's a Donnie book, right? Yep. Yeah, Donnie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, he writes so much, it's hard to keep track anymore. There's yes, a lot, he does. A lot of vampire books. What but book yeah. isn't a Donnie book? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but like, I think at the end of that first arc, spoilers, but like there's that, that hanging scene. Like, I mean, like you just, Donnie's a really emotional writer. Like, I mean, everyone lo loves to talk about God Country, like, for like the action and like the art but like it's it's absolutely like a family oriented like hard to digest story about dementia and like how hard it can be on a family and like that's what i love about donnie's work like it's always about family yeah. um, his that one is like to me I, I consider country vampire where yours is urban vampire yeah yeah actually this book is set it's not set in the book until third issue but uh set in red bank new jersey where uh, Jane and Silent Bob's Secret Stash is. Uh, it's where I went to high school. It's where Chris went to high school about 10 years before me. Um, and it's just, uh, you know, I'm a little more clean cut than I was in my youth, but I was, I was definitely a little punk rock, you know, shitty kid. We all, we all hung out in the, the park with all the junkies. And, you know, it's, uh, this is very much like drawing on that, that part of my life. But yeah, this, this book is, uh, I'd call this like something between urban and suburban, like whatever that middle space is. I can definitely see that. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, that was, that was kind of like part of the, the pitch that I gave Chris. Like I wanted to do something with like a little more of an edge to it. Like the second issue is set. Uh, I don't think it's ever said, but it's set in like very Eastern Pennsylvania in like a old industrial town. Like it was like a, like a grittiness and like a, sort of like, a, I don't know, just like a, like a 1970s, 1980s kind of feel to it, even though it's set in the present. So before we wrap this up, Frank, one thing I, I want really got to ask you since we've got you here, it's something that um, I think I've asked you in, in the past, but I, I, you know, a lot of, a lot of people, um, a lot of, especially of our viewers uh, love to watch the ascension of the indie comics writer. Um, you've mentioned, you've got some fandoms. What would be your dream projects um, or dream companies that you would love to kind of tackle in the future? Oof, uh just off the top of my head, uh, Power Rangers, Ninja Turtles, top two. Um, and those have been like very loosely the editors who I've had the most traction with ever out of anyone I've ever talked to. I'm definitely not writing anything right now, but I, I hope to keep cultivating those relationships and, and get my shot one day. Um, I'm not, I was never like a big DC guy. Like I like Batman. I like Superman. Um, I read some DC and I have like a decent C DC collection down on the lower shelves over here. Um, but uh, off the top of my head, like I don't have anything for DC. I've, I've, I've got like some dream pitches from Marvel. Um, I'd love to resurrect dark Avengers, uh, but with like a different team, you know, sort of like the non uh, Squadron Supreme uh, version of the Justice League. So they like, got Sentry for Superman, Moon Knight for Batman, Namor for Aquaman. Like just make it like a real cow powder keg of like characters who are going to like just destroy one another and put them on a suicide mission. Like I, I think that would be a dope book. Uh, I've got a great Hawkeye pitch. Hawkeye is my favorite character ever. And, and I, I got something that, that I think can elevate him to like a list. Um, Iron Fist, Black Panther, um, Kate Bishop, Hawkeye. Like, I mean, I, I've definitely got like a list, but honest to God, like if Marvel was going to give me like a D-man one shot or one page story, I'd, I'd, I'd take my shot, you know, like Hamilton. <laughs> I love it. And I like that, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, elevating Hawkeye. I think the natural progression that we've seen, and we mentioned Donny Cates, um, who's really a prime example of kind of make your name for yourself on that independent comics market, um, you kind of step up and start doing whether it's a licensed property or uh, one of the big two. Uh, you, you make yourself a household name, and then now you can do your own creator-owned stuff to a whole wider audience. Um, and 
I love personally the Power Rangers Ninja Turtle stuff. I'd love to see you get an opportunity on a mini series um, to tell, especially with your tone. Um, <laughs> if you take some of your tone into those properties, I love when those stories get a little bit more adult, a little bit more Grittier. serious. Yeah. Um, both of those series I'm a big fan of. So I, I would absolutely love that. I'm on board for that. Do you guys see uh, do you guys see that uh that short film that uh they put out a couple years ago on YouTube, The Power Rangers, like the really gritty one with like Dawson? Oh, yeah, and- yeah, yeah. Adi, the Adi Shankar uh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah with James Vanderbeek. Yes, that, that was- would that would one hundred percent be like the way I would want to do it. And it would never ever get past licensing. <laughs> um, and <laughs> well, I don't know that I, I don't know that I could top what Ryan's doing. Like Ryan Parrott, he's he's absolutely killing it. Like every issue is just the most amazing fan service and still a really good story. And that's like a, a really greasy tight walk, rope to walk. Like, so yeah. I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty amazed by what he's been able to do. I, I like the way that he's been able to give it a little bit more of a gritty feel by bringing in characters like, um, you know, Draken and the Ranger Slayer who have um, such kind of a, a more kind of a, there's a darker story there. Um, I'm very hopeful for the future of that franchise and, and kind of progressing less campy, even though that's what we may have loved as children yeah. as, as we kind of progress into adults. So, well, well, that's, that's kind of the beauty of, of the, the, the Ranger comics, like as they are, like they're, they're like the teen Titans of, of like the power Rangers universe. Like it's got that tone of like an eighties, nineties teen Titans book where it's dealing with some serious stuff, but still like, hovering just under PG-13, like keeping it pretty close to the source material while still like pushing the boundaries um, and doing like all the fun comic booky stuff. Like they have their own version of S.H.I.E.L.D. They've got like alternate dimensions now, like evil doppelgangers, like all the cliche comic book things, but like in a way we've never seen it before. And that's kind of what makes them fun. Um, Yeah. I mean, look, listen, I would love to write it and I'll write it any way anyone tells me to. A couple, three, four days ago, I had a, a Twitter thread of like all the pitches I have ready to go. Like if, if anyone over at Boom's taking a look, feel free to go retweet that if you see it. Uh, there's some good stuff in there. And we'll put links to all your social accounts in the description of this video if you guys are interested in following Frank on Instagram, Twitter. We'll put all the social media down there. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I will also add... Um, for anyone who can find it, there's links everywhere. But uh, I do a twice a month newsletter. Um, and it's definitely my favorite thing that I do to keep up with like fans, people who like my work. Um, but uh, there is something very cool coming for the announcement of No Heroin at the end of the month. And people who are on my newsletter are going to get a first crack at it. So if you see this before the 31st, hop on the newsletter and you'll, uh, you'll have a shot before everyone else. So we've talked about Dead End Kids, we've talked about the Ringo nomination, and we just talked about his great upcoming book, No Heroin. That releases, what, June 24th again, right? Yep. Um, And uh, I think now's a good time to to, to jump into this. Uh, I'm not not taking pot shots on anyone, so no one take this personally, because I know speculators and and investors have different views on comics, but uh, if if you can listen for just one minute and, and take this to heart, if you see a dope book like No Heroin, or if it's not No Heroin, if it's if it's the next, you know, Donnie Cates book, we've talked about Donnie a bunch. If it's a, the next Source Point book, you know, The Rejected, Ogre, any of the other books that blew up, uh, it doesn't really matter who it's from. But if you see a, a book that you think you're gonna like, regardless of whether you think you can flip it, take take the time to pre-order it. Like pre-ordering is the backbone of this industry, and like it's it's hard to, to make a book work when people don't pre-order it. Um, let me give you an example. Uh, Source Point Press did a book, Ogre, uh, two and a half years ago now. Ogre did amazing. First issue, sold thousands of copies. Uh, a lot of it was spec though. Like a lot of people went in and bought out the copies from all the stores. Um, and, and then number two and number three came out and, and no one who wanted to actually read the book could get copies of, of number one so no one bought two and three like the the sales dipped tremendously um and this is a a killer book Uh, bob sally wrote it uh sean daly who was nominated for a ringo award alongside me last year illustrated it um and and this is the kind of book that like would have deserved to be developed into a movie and because it didn't sell well it may never get you know optioned um but even more so like like i said this is the backbone of industry the way it works is comic publisher puts a book in solicits Retailers pre-order the book, they sell it to the readers, 
And the readers put money back into the retailers' pockets, which goes back into the distributors' pockets, which goes back to the publishers, which pays the creators, which lets me make another book, or lets Bob make another book, or lets Donnie make another book. Um, but when you don't pre-order and you go buy up all the copies, you stop other people from reading the book, you stop the next issues from selling well, you make any retailer who took a chance on the second issues and bought a lot because the orders on the first one were high, they're not able to move those books as well. Like, I mean, it's just, there's so much negative backlash that happens when, when we don't pre-order books. Now I'm not saying like, yeah, you have to pre-order every book, but if one really speak, if you heard about No Heroin Tonight and you think that sounds awesome, go pre-order it. Or if it's a Donnie book or, or if it's a source point pro or whatever, you know, um, and again, I'm not trying to knock anybody. Like I, I definitely, I like the spec side of things. I, I like, I like the investment side. I read a lot of the articles on CBSI. Like I think that it's super interesting, but the reality of it is it can be very harmful. Comics is an ecosystem. Imagine like, like Alaska, right? What, what happens if the bears eat all the salmon, right? Everything's out of whack. So if you guys go nuts and buy all the, all the copies of something like, and you do it too often and you know, it, it can have a ripple effect that can give us another version of the late nineties. Anyway, that's, that's my, my little soapbox and put it away. Um, and, and if you heard this interview and you thought no heroin sounded dope, pre-order it. That's exactly right. And that's exactly why we here at Simpleman's Comics made the move from speculation driven content into a more broad based content because we wanted to be able to do things like give you the last call show where we're talking FOC, where we're giving you that opportunity to pre-order those books with your LCS. Make sure you're doing what Frank just talked about to let your LCS know you want those books, but also doing right by the community because you're not taking those available books away from prospective customers and readers. Um, and also for your own benefit, you're, you're able to, as we often talk about on the show, get a substantial discount by pre-ordering in advance as many shop owners are more than happy to take 10, 20, 25% off of an order if you will lock it down and especially if you will prepay. So make sure you're talking to your LCS, um, make sure you're paying attention to books like No Heroin because it's especially important in the independent comics market. Um, you know, a Marvel book is gonna be printed 50, 100,000. There's quite often times enough to go around with the exception of those crazy punchline scenarios. But with these independent small press books, we talk about it on the channel all the time, especially in remote areas like where I live in South Carolina. If you go take the only three they've got off the shelf, it's that much tougher for books to get in the hands of readers. So be on the lookout for No Heroin on June 24th, but make sure if this is a book that piques your interest, if the consistency of Source Boy Press, if the absolute secondary market kind of phenomenon that Frank Gogol and Dead End Kids were, at all intrigues you, make sure you are pre-ordering this book. Uh, make sure you're talking to your LCS and make sure you're locked in. Uh, for Simpleman's Comics, I'm Jack. This is Brian. Thank you, Frank, for joining us. And be sure to check out our next Creator Spotlight.